Welcome back to Better Off Ball, the life 147 days. I am your host and storyteller, Andrea Wilson-Woods. Whether you're watching the video or listening to the podcast, I really appreciate you tuning in. Let's get started. Days 62 through 67, Monday through Saturday, July 16th through the 21st, 2001. Two smiley faces. I don't know what I'm feeling. I don't know if I want a leash restraining my course of breathing right now. Fantasy world seems so much more peaceful. If I was happy, I wouldn't have to escape reality. I don't think I was built for certain things. I'm no trophy. What if a cloud, the mind, the last thing I need is a dip back into depression. That's what created them in the first place. Maybe I've been here this entire time. Distraction, sigh. I don't know. I don't know. Adrian's journal entry dated July 3rd, 2001. We check into the hospital at 9 a.m. The nurses already have a nail polish remover pad for Adrian. We both laugh, but there is something disconcerting about the nurses remembering Adrian always wears nail polish, like the cook who knows how I like my eggs. We spend too much time here. Adrian takes the blue nail polish off her middle finger and then attaches the monitor that tracks her heart rate respiratory rate, and pulse. I find it ironic that two layers of nail polish can prevent a sophisticated piece of machinery from working. Despite all the drugs, Adrian's nails keep growing. They are long, healthy, and strong, unlike her body. Before long, Dr. Marco arrives. Though Dr. Wallace suspected Adrian might have a teratoma, Dr. Marco explains there are three reasons why she doesn't have one. Teratomas are masses that would have shown up on any CAT scan, since platinum, the chemo drug Adrian refuses to take again, should have shrunk any teratomas. Those tumors respond well to that particular drug. Adrian's symptoms do not match the diagnosis of a teratoma. I should have known better. Part of me needed Dr. Wallace to be right. Adrian has a teratoma, which is more treatable according to my books. I read all about teratomas last night. I didn't pray for it the way I prayed Adrian had ovarian cancer instead of liver cancer. Instead, the elusive teratoma became my beacon of hope. Dr. Marco delays chemo because he is still concerned about the possibility of an abscess in Adrian's rectum. He starts Adrian on two different antibiotics and says he will have a gastroenterologist, GI, look at her CAT scan from this past weekend. As the attending physician this week, Dr. Feinstein attempts a rectal exam but it proves to be inconclusive because he has to stop when Adrian cries. I see she has hemorrhoids now and I wonder what caused them. Then I remember the silly smiley faces I draw on our spiral notebook whenever Adrian has a bowel movement. There has only been one smiley face during the past three days. Given that amount of constipation, of course she has hemorrhoids. When no one is able to mimic Dr. Wallace's findings, they are dismissed. A weird rash has erupted on Adrian's back. Its appearance reminds me of ringworm, only it is straight, not round. The nurse scrapes a sample of it for testing and applies topical ointment. When I ask several doctors how Adrian got a fungus on her back, they don't know the answer. As they do every Monday, Paz visits the entire fourth floor. Adrian leans over and smiles for her picture with Vera, the black lab. Her face is almost paler than the white gown she's wearing and her eyes are sunken into her head. The volunteer sees Adrian is sicker than usual and keeps the visit short. I thank her for coming by and I watch the Polaroid picture develop. With a tired smile, a wan Adrian stares back at the camera. Even Vera looks sad and today is only the first day of this hospital stay. Great. That evening, I simmer when Adrian still hasn't gotten her PCA. She receives Dilaudid through her IV now, but Dr. Marco ordered a PCA earlier that day so the doctors can assess Adrian's pain more accurately. We had also requested an oxygen mask hours ago instead of the usual nasal tube, but Adrian doesn't have one yet. When her 8 p.m. meds are late, I finally lose my temper and ask to speak to the house supervisor. Keeping my voice calm, I tell her what we need as I check off each complaint in my notebook, not bothering to hide my notes from her. In many ways, a hospital is no different from any other business. 
one has to speak to the right person to get things done. Within 15 minutes, our needs are met. Adrian sleeps and fits. The pain wakes her up. Every time I hear the click of the PCA machine, I know she is hurting and I cannot fix it. The kid who had so few colds I can count them on one hand now lies in a hospital bed, unable to sleep, with heavy narcotics in her body that seem to be doing no good. I remember one time when I let her stay home from school because her head cold had reached its peak. We cuddled together on the couch, drank hot chocolate, and watched as a Los Angeles jury pronounced O.J. Simpson not guilty for the murders of his former wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, and Ron Goldman. We both gasped. Then, a pensive nine-year-old Adrian asked, How can something like that happen, sissy? I don't know, kiddo. How could something like this happen to you now? I don't know. Sissy, come look at this. Adrian summons me into the bathroom the following morning to examine her pee, which is turned burnt orange. Beautiful for a sunset, ominous for a sick girl. Don't flush it. We'll have the nurse look at it. Despite its tint, Adrian's urine shows no traces of blood and the analysis is normal. Even her CBC is normal, revealing no infection, thus rendering the antibiotics useless. Her bilirubin is high, which might have caused her urine to change color, but no one will give me a definitive answer on that issue either. Ugh. The GI agrees with Dr. Marco's recommendations, a contrast enema and an x-ray of the pelvis. However, one doctor agreeing with the other does not guarantee immediate results. Like our first ER visit and Adrian's biopsy surgery, you have to wait your turn. I sense Dr. Marco's frustration when the GI department delays Adrian's test, but I am relieved when he fights on behalf of Adrian. Behind the hospital doors in this land of medical bureaucracy, his words carry far more weight than mine do. Dr. Marco explains the situation is urgent. Adrian's chemo is on hold until the tests are done. With that argument, the GI and other departments cooperate. Done that afternoon, the pelvis x-ray shows stool in the colon, but not the rectum. Meanwhile, Adrian continues to push the button on the PCA, pumping more Dilaudid into her body to assuage her increasing pain. The more medication she receives, the more constipated she becomes. However, I'm less worried about any blockage at this point and more worried about her getting the nutrients she needs. She hasn't kept food down all day. Like the California wildfires, there are so many hot spots in Adrian's body right now that doctors don't know which one should be treated first. They are focused on what happened over the weekend, and now there's the orange pee, the funky rash, and the constant nausea. What about the cancer pain, which desperately needs the chemo that was supposed to start yesterday? I never asked that question, but it burns inside of me, my own personal fire, waiting to be put out. Instead of pain waking her up tonight, Adrian's nausea and subsequent vomiting wake us both up at 3 a.m. We had not been sleeping long. The attending physician gave Adrian magnesium citrate laxative at 2.15 a.m. in preparation for the lower GI enema in seven hours. At least two-thirds of it comes up, and I worry Adrian will not be ready for the test. I find out later the magnesium citrate was not necessary, and I want to hurt that physician for interrupting Adrian's sleep and for making her sick. I decide not to tell Adrian she didn't need it. While John goes with Adrian to radiology for the contrast enema, I gather my toiletries and go to the parent sleep room and shower area. To get there, I walk to the end of the four west wing where I pass the big steel doors to the bone marrow transplant, BMT, unit. Every time I see those doors, I think how much worse it could be for us. At least we don't have to wear protective gear and mask to see Adrian. But people survive bone marrow transplants, don't they? After bypassing the BMT unit, I open a fire exit door. A sign above it reads, keep door closed. I pass stairs that lead somewhere and then go through yet another door, which lands me into a white corridor that connects to another building where the parent room is located with two restrooms, two showers, 
four locked sleep rooms and a washer and dryer. It has all the amenities of home, except for its antiseptic smell, lack of loofahs, and tubes of toothpaste with missing caps. I always expect to see another parent here, especially since BMT parents get priority. They are not allowed to sleep in their children's rooms, but I haven't yet. I know some stay at the Ronald McDonald house down the street, but I need to be closer to Adrian. Others don't stay at all. I felt awkward at first, walking around with my bag and towel, navigating the maze. I even got lost twice, but I'm used to it now. The housekeeper smiles when she sees me and sometimes gives me extra towels. I shower as quickly as possible, otherwise I will lose myself in negative thoughts, as Adrian would say. John and Adrian return. When I ask her how the test went, she frowns. John waits until Adrian falls asleep for a mid-morning nap before telling me how horrible the contrast enema was. Kiddo was in so much pain. I just wanted to take it away. The enema also caused diarrhea, which counts as a bowel movement, although it's not ideal. When Adrian wakes up, the doctor gives her Lasix to help her urinate. She also begins her first dose of Epigen, the drug that should improve her anemia. Dr. Feinstein examines Adrian that evening. He tells us the culture from the rash proves it is not a fungus, but a kind of unknown skin infection they will treat with antibiotics for 48 hours. I ask if we can start chemo tonight, and he hesitates. She'll feel better once she's had chemo, I say. John and I plead with him. Okay, but we're going to watch for mucus in the lungs after the treatment is over. I love how doctors call chemo treatment when it's actually poison. Any treatment that kills healthy cells should be questioned, not that we have any alternatives. A few hours later, a nurse covered in scrubs brings in the poison, and we discover the timing of the adriamycin is different. When I ask the nurse why, she summons the doctor. Most nurses are wary of John and me. Apparently our reputation precedes us. One of the few nurses we like, Helen, told us what other staff members said. The kid is great, but the parents, watch out. They ask too many questions. They are too involved and they are too needy. I don't care what they think. Besides, these same people asked me about Adrian's PCA dosage last month because they lost her chart. And we ask too many questions, right. At 12.20 a.m., Dr. Feinstein explains there are different protocols for different combinations of drugs. A lower dosage of adriamycin is given in conjunction with iphosphamide. Instead of cisplatinum, the I'd rather be dead than death drug. Since Adrian is receiving dexrezoxine to protect her heart, the adriamycin will be administered much faster than before, but still in 24-hour increments. I thank Dr. Feinstein for his thoroughness. All John and I want is to understand the process. The following day, Dr. Feinstein delays Adrian's chemo because her urine is not clean enough, meaning it is not separated from her stool. Even though I wanted chemo to start last night, I don't ask why this non-separation issue matters. At least Adrian is going to the bathroom. The milk of magnesia is doing its job. One fire out, another one breaks out. A nurse takes a culture of a white spot in Adrian's left nostril another unexplainable skin abnormality that appeared overnight. I don't understand why these problems are popping up, especially considering how good chemo has been for Adrian's skin. In two months, the pimples on her face, the benign cyst inside her mouth, and the warts on her hands have all disappeared. The poison has improved harmless skin conditions, but it has not reduced the cancerous tumors inside her body. How ironic. That afternoon, we meet Dr. Howdy Doody, a tall, redheaded man who specializes in neuropathic pain. I like him immediately because it seems important to him John and me comprehend what is going on in Adrian's body, or at least what his theory is. Without being condescending, he speaks to Adrian. Do you know that the nerves send signals to the brain that there is pain? She nods. Well, your brain has memory of that pain, and your body pays attention to your pain. She nods again. I fervently take notes. The drugs we give you address the signals from the nerves. We're going to switch you from Ativan to Valium. It might help you relax more. Then Dr. Duty tilts his head toward the door and eyes John and me. We follow him outside. Adrian appears too tired to care. 
Don't ask Adrian about her pain anymore. Let her bring it up. Why not? I ask. You don't want to reinforce the acute nature of a chronic illness. So by asking her if she's in pain, her brain may process that information and believe she feels pain, even if her body doesn't, because her brain remembers it. Something like that. Just let her bring it up. I think the Valium will make a big difference too. Let me know if you need anything else. Dr. Duty shakes our hands, says goodbye, and walks away from us. I like him. Why have we never met him before? Adrian begins the first day of her third round of chemo at 5.20 p.m. She receives dextrozoxine followed by adriamycin for 15 minutes, then ifosfamide for one hour followed by mesna, which will protect her kidneys for three hours. At 8 p.m., she takes her first dose of Valium as well as her first Marinol pill. I marvel at how this small, brown, round ball is synthetic marijuana. Adrian smiles after swallowing it. I can't wait to tell my friends I'm taking pot by prescription. I laugh. If it works, she can tell the whole world. Please let it work. You can't lose any more weight, kiddo. 15 pounds is enough. I hear moaning on the other side of the curtain. Adrian's roommate is eight-year-old Veronica, who has been diagnosed with neuroblastoma that started in her stomach. She had surgery to remove the tumor, and now she is undergoing chemotherapy. Unfortunately, her body is not tolerating the treatment well, and she is experiencing all of the possible side effects, including sores in her mouth and rectum. Her constant whining grates on everyone's nerves. I should be sympathetic, but Veronica has a better chance of survival. I looked it up. I call a nurse to help her and go back to sleep. Poor kid. She needs her mom right now, not some stranger. Adrian wakes up hungry. She devours her breakfast, and I prepare for it to come back up by grabbing the kidney-shaped bowl. But then a remarkable thing happens. It doesn't. By noon, Adrian wants buffalo wings for lunch, and she eats almost an entire plate by herself. Friends drop by to visit, and Adrian tells funny stories, but by far the most entertaining thing is watching her laugh at her own jokes. John and I look at each other. Does she seem a little loopy? Yeah, he answers. Do you care? No. John and I smile. Adrian is stoned, but she feels no pain. She keeps food down and she appears relaxed and happy. If this is the side effect of pot, why wasn't she on it sooner? The doctors are not as nonchalant about Adrian's condition. They don't give Adrian any more Valium for the rest of the day and they consider lowering the dosage of Dilaudid. I nod my head in agreement, as long as they don't take away the Marinol, I won't argue with them. Adrian seems to be retaining fluid, so another dose of Lasix is given that evening. With the effects of the drugs waning, a more coherent Adrian complains. I feel like I have to pee all the time, sissy, and it burns when I stop. I tell the nurse, who suspects a urinary tract infection, but the urine analysis is negative. I suggest a bath might make Adrian feel better. She likes that idea. Gathering several towels, clean clothes, and soap, we walk down the hall. Adrian pulls her IV pole beside her to the bathtub room. When I close the door behind us, I think we can pretend we are at home, only this bathroom is smaller and doesn't have a toilet. I help Adrian step into the tub, where she sits for 15 minutes. The hot water relieves some of the burning sensation, and she feels better when we return to her room. However, Adrian receives more Lasix at 1.50 a.m., and she stays up most of the night going back and forth to the restroom. She tries her best not to disturb Veronica, whose bed she has to pass to get to the bathroom they share. By morning, the burning sensation is gone. Another fire that came and went. Today is the third and last day of this round of chemo. Of course, things don't go as smoothly as we would like. The phlegm in Adrian's chest has the doctors concerned about pneumonia, but a chest x-ray is negative. She has no fluid in her lungs. Adrian continues coughing throughout the day. 
and I become disturbed when she spits blood out of her mouth. The doctors assure me the blood and cough are not coming from Adrian's lungs, which they treat with albuterol to open up her airways. John brings copies of the Burbank Leader to the hospital. Adrian made the front page. The headline reads, Burbank High Sophomore is One Tough Cookie. The reporter used my quote about Adrian, which sounds cheesy in retrospect. Except for some factual errors, the article is good, and I show it to everyone on the floor. Adrian rolls her eyes as she coughs for the upteenth time today. She hates it when I brag too much, but she does like the picture of herself. My favorite part is the end. No matter what has been thrown her way, Adrian has big plans for the future. I'm looking forward to going to college to study zoology and religion, she said. Thank you for watching and listening to Better Off Bald, A Life of 147 Days. Please subscribe to my channel and stay tuned for the next episode.